Hi, Green Girl fam. This is Stephanie Rodriguez, editor and producer of the Regenerate Revolution Life Soil Success Podcast. I want to apologize for the background noise. Oh, welcome to the Regenerate Podcast. This is Mark Irvin, the host with Green Grow. We today are with Brett Richter from Microbe Life, Microbe Lift, and he's going to give us a story about how his company was founded, the microbes our company works with, and everything else, how it deals with cannabis. So welcome to the show. I got to say, thank you for having me. It's a, Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here and be with you in person again. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while, so it's great to you know be shoulder to shoulder with you. And, and we we did go salmon fishing once together, mm-hmm. and everyone on the boat puked except for us. So that was good. <laughs> that was uh, years Duffy, ago. remember Duffy? Yeah, Duffy's God, still was, with us. He was puking his guts out. Yeah, Duffy's still with us. He's home. He, uh, he's back in Queens, New York, but uh, he's still very much part of the team. We just won't take him fishing. Anymore. No, you can't take Duffy fishing. <laughs> you get Duffy fishing. So why don't you tell the audience who may not be completely familiar with micro life, micro lift? You guys do obviously a little bit of pond stuff and some and some hydro and some fertilizer let's just go into it how to get founded all right so i mean uh, it's, it's a very unique uh, story the ecological labs was founded in 1976 by my father and my uncle michael and barry richter and uh, very unique for two uh, you know men growing up and raised in the city you know not farms you know not no ag background yeah and you know it's one of the big questions how did you go into this being from the city and to make a very long story short how ecological was founded my father barry was such a natural dynamic salesperson and he couldn't get anything and at 22 years old he was working for a chemical company in manhattan selling you know chemicals to custodians hospitals engineers you know bleaches to clean the walls the floors by the time he was 23, he had a whole team of people under him, you know, you know that he, you know, selling the products. And at this company, they had their chemists, they had biologists, microbiologists, but they were selling chemicals. Yeah. And one of their own biologists that was there on their team was about 15, 16 years older than my father, and became a father figure, but my, like a, a mentor to my dad. And he was a genius, and he had all these formulations for earth-friendly microbes when no one cared about the environment. Mm-hmm. 1976 at that point, 1977, yeah. 78, you poured the chemical in, you applied a chemical, and no one even thought twice about yeah. the dangers or harm it can cause to people, animals, the environment. And his name was Wally, and Wally and my dad were super close, and he said to my father, Barry, listen, I have all of these formulations for these earth-friendly microbes that I developed. Mm-hmm. He said, they're dynamic, this is what they do. He said, but I'm a science, I don't know how to sell them, I can make them. And he said to my father, you know, you're a dynamic salesperson, you could sell anything. Why don't we leave this company and start, you know, a biological company? And that's the long and short of how it started in 1976. So there was wow, three, an incredible story. Yeah. Three partners involved. There was Barry, my uncle Mike, my father's brother, and Wally. And the three partners started Ecological. And what was the first microbe based product? I mean, you know, pond product or agriculture product or whatever. I mean, what? You know, well, retail products were never even on yeah. the idea. The, the retail wasn't even a thought in the, uh, the, the inception of the company. Uh, it was bacillus bacteria um, um, that could break down human waste, animal waste, break down uh, Interesting. Um, different types of waste and water. Mm-hmm. So the target markets that we were going after at the, the early years was farm and waste management. And, and, and you know, for the, the listeners, people don't really realize this, but wastewater systems now across the United States are deploying multiple ways to break down waste and fat and everything that's in the water. And, and biologicals are a huge part in how you dissolve proteins and dissolve fat and yep. dissolve waste. Oh, yep, yep. Yep. Fat soils and greases, yep. yeah, you know, the FOG, right? Yep. So you know, they would go in and they would say, we have these dynamic earth-friendly microbes that could break down the waste, the solids, the odors, and allow you to release the water back into city sewers mm-hmm. all naturally. And of course, at that time, there's a lot of pushback. Well, I have a chemical that can do it oh, in 24 hours. Why do I need a microbe? Why do I need a bacteria? It's a snake oil. It's not going to work. You know, that was the big pushback back then. So it wasn't the easiest sale. There was a lot of education involved, a lot of proving to the engineers the, uh, the, wastewater, treatment the waste, plant. wastewater treatment plants yeah. that we could prove what we were doing. And with a lot of hard work, I mean, it, you know, we, we showed that we could do it. And the pricing, of course, was, you know, efficient and made sense for the wastewater treatment plants to use. So um, you would, we would break down, especially in farms, 
where the uh, animal waste would go into football. Dairy manure. Dairy, dairy manure pork producers. Yep. Um, uh, chick poultry producers, mm -hmm. where they would either slaughter the animals, and you would have, unfortunately, you'd have, you know, the bones, the blood, you'd have the feathers, the grease. Yes. Uh, you know, go into football field size pits 10 feet deep that would crust over the agitators couldn't even agitate or you know even yeah. mix you know mix the solids and our microbes would go in there they're anaerobic and aerobic they would work with and without oxygen they would work with and without light so they could go into this system and naturally over the course of time they would liquefy break down the crust on the sol on the surface it would liquefy the waste and then the farmers could then even now spray irrigate they can yep. use that now uh, that waste as a fertilizer that yep. that we liquefied yep. and they could spray irrigate and it would eliminate the odors yeah, we, yeah. And see, that's an incredible story. I mean, because, you know, a lot of people re need to realize that microbes are the great decomposers of the world. I mean, they, they can not decompose things, but and they can help benefit other ways. But there's a lot of decomposer microbes that if we didn't have them, you'd have bones and blood and feathers sitting there for hundreds of years almost. Oh, so decompose. There, there, there's no decomposition. Yeah. And, you know, the really interesting thing with it, um, and un yeah, there was a, a huge on the East Coast, a huge uh, poultry producer and I remember one of the stories of my father um, and my uncle and Wally the, in the, the biologist the biologist behind all of our microbes they took like a small plane into the farm they landed and they were slaughtering 250,000 birds a day. Oh, my and this God. is back in the 70s, yeah. late 70s or early 80s. Yeah. And the major problem at this point not only was just you know the waste and the solids, the odor, the county. Oh yeah. Stunk. Yeah. The county stunk. The neighboring farms couldn't take it, and our microbes would go in and eliminate the odors. And, and odor suppression through microbial deployment wasn't, I mean, that wasn't even a thing. So no one cared. Yeah. No yeah. one cared. That was unfortunate. No yeah. one cared. And now, it, now it's the mainstream for odor suppression in some of these types of farms, especially farms that are USDA regulated and everything else. So it, it's it's definitely mainstream from where the origin story came from oh, yeah. to where we are today. Now, let's transition into, you guys have, you know, besides the pond, division of things too you guys have stuff for agriculture and and uh you know lawn and garden and and specifically i wanted to dive into like your photosynthetic bacteria because a lot of people may not understand that mm -hmm. they've never heard of that and they want to know what is the photosynthetic bacteria and how does it play into my, my gardening okay well you yeah. well, great leaning well thank you for that and so just a little bit more digression so our company is split down the middle to a commercial business and then retail business and the retail business started to come about 18 20 years after the company was founded so we were in other commercial applications the septic industry you know mm -hmm. septic tanks uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, for the pumpers that would pump out the waste uh, restaurants for grease traps and the microbes would work in those applications again the animal husbandry uh, as well as wastewater treatment plants and then we started to get into the commercial agriculture yeah right and that was what then led us into the cannabis side of the cultivation business but the photosynthetic bacteria is something that we've always had and it's very unique. We've never patented, patented our technology because you give up your formula and seven yeah. years later it's become public domain. Yeah. And then anyone can make one little change and it's new and improved and your IP is done. I absolutely agree with that. You know, people always ask me the same thing with our, we have a fermented biochar that we have mycelium in there and like, and we ferment it in a certain way and everyone's like, why don't you patent it? I'm like, because if I patent it, then somebody will change the formula by 1%, as you just said, and now they have my Urshine biochar that's fermented in 1% difference, which is not going to change the performance drastically. So there's no point, right? So, no point. You know. So we've never taken the, I mean, we've discussed it always at certain points, but after 46 years, fortunately, I mean, it's been a great run to be in business. And, you know, yeah. there's ups and downs, challenges that come. Everything's different. Every year could be another success or another failure. Yeah. And nothing's always, you know, rainbows and unicorns, yeah. I say. You know, there are. But um, with the microbes that we have and the consortium that we have, it was developed these photosynthetic microbes. And uh, we, we've had, massive publicly owned you know chemical companies biological companies overseas and international you know international companies 
have flat out come to us and said, we have tried to reverse engineer your core technology, which is our photosynthetic microbe. We cannot do it. You know, we've had companies come to us and tell us if I wanted to figure out how you breathe life into your soil with Green Grow, organic, sustainable, all in one soil additives for your gardening and farming needs with the highest quality, non harmful ingredients. Locally sourced, Green Grow promotes probiotic soil building that will nurture and help your soil flourish, maintaining a living soil system for your plants to thrive. Easy to use products for all stages of growing. You take pride in what you grow, and so do we. Grow only the best with Green Grow Biologicals. Order online or find your nearest location where Green Grow products are sold. We're essentially doing with the photosynthetic bacteria, plants go through photosynthesis by nature. You know, simple biology that if we paid attention in high school biology, we learned photosynthesis. And the layman term is we are taking the energy from the sun, which is the carbon. The plant is converting that carbon within its cellular structure inside the plant circulatory system into sugar. And when plants go through photosynthesis, they're feeding themselves. So our product being a photosynthetic bacteria enhances the plant's ability to go through photosynthesis. So to make it really easy to understand, you feed the bacteria to the plant, whether you're using it as a foliar or whether you're going into the soil or you're going into a reservoir, a CEA system, vertical farming. When our microbes get inside the plant circulatory system, it's about a 45 minute process, whether you're using it as a foliar spray or going through the root system. Is it systemic? It could be both. It could be foliar or systemic. Okay. All right. So it could work from top down, yeah. bottom up, no okay. matter how you apply it and you'll get the same. There's no better way to do it. Just the preference of the user, right? Mm -hmm. And the photosynthetic bacteria, we have three major benefits. So the photosynthetic bacteria, the bacteria gets inside the plant circulatory system and it creates biofilms. It gets inside the phloem, the xylem, the root, the shoot, the, the tip. It gets inside the chlorophyll, the chloroplast, and it creates these biofilms. And the biofilms attach themselves inside the plant circul circulatory system and expand it. So now when the plant goes through photosynthesis, there's more room within the plant's system to take in more sugar. So it can feed itself more when you use our bacteria. When you're converting more carbon to sugar and feeding yourself more, you're gonna get faster growth. You're gonna get better tasting plants. You're gonna be, you, uh, be if the plant will become more pest, pathogen, and parasite resistant because a healthier plant will be more disease resistant. So you're allowing the plant to thrive naturally with using microbes that are in the environment that are all natural. And uh, one of the nice parts about the photosynthetic microbes that we produce, they're amazing light collectors. Now, one of the plant's jobs in nature is to collect light. That's what they do, right? But our photosynthetic microbes have a much wider spectrum of light collection than the plants do on their own. So now when the microbes are within the plant, it allows the plant to collect more available light, whether you're growing indoors or outdoors, artificial versus natural. So now the more light you take in, you're now increasing the photosynthetic process again. Yeah, and I mean, you know, from, from a base level perspective, we're talking about potentially a systemic microbe that has a symbiotic relationship with the plant. Mm -hmm. The plant is going to be probably feeding some kind of sugars to it. While wow, for lit for life, yep. the, the, the microbe is going to be increasing the photosynthetic capabilities of the plant, which the plant likes. It's going to keep it you know, more chlorophyll. Everything else is going to be flowing a little bit more smoothly. So, when do I use this product? When are the ideal times? What, what life cycle? Well, the, the photosynthetic microbes, which in the you know, in our microbe life lineup would be our photosynthesis plus and other states, same other pro, it'd be the plus C in California, Photo Plus O in Oregon, same product, just different labels. The state registration because the state registration, the state horrible. registration. Oh. we hate california registration just so everyone listening from california yes you make it really difficult for anyone to do business um, the state of california didn't want us to have the name photosynthesis in the name of the product they said it's too suggestive it's too it's too forthfront and we didn't understand but to get approved we had we changed name to plus c so it was confusing at first people say is this a vitamin is this something i'm drinking as a human it was just instead of photosynthesis plus we called it plus C and C just means for California. It's crazy. Yeah, with green aminos, our product, they wouldn't let us name it green aminos unless 
we added synthetic green aminos to the product. And I said, why am I not doing that? It's an organic product. Like, well, there's no organic aminos. I'm like, absolutely there is. The, the proteins break down into amino. That's how it works. And it's full of protein. And they're like, no, no, we need to see that kind of chemical process happen. We don't have that recorded in our books anywhere. I'm like, the microbes break down the proteins into amino acids, you stupid bastards. And they wouldn't let me do it. Oh, we would go through the whole mode of action, how it works, and unfortunately, it's just different with certain states. The, you know, the Department of Agriculture's or could be, you know, more stringent in other states. I mean, and it, it's frustrating, but we have to play within the rules if we want to sell the product. Don't you think that we should really have just the USDA do a 50-state registration? You know, you, you you start you just merge all the departments of ag with the USDA, so they have the registration agent. Mm -hmm. But it's one set of rules for the United States. Wouldn't that just be easy? I mean, wouldn't that just be easy? But every state's different, and a lot of revenues collected from the state registration, some more than in other states, and it's a challenge challenge for companies like us to have to, you know, manage it and then to sell it through and, you know, the distributors that carry and sell the product to have to stock different labels for different states. I mean, it, it's a process. I mean, you got Arizona, it's $25 to register a product. California, it's 250 plus <laughs> registration, tonnage, mill assessment, yeah. and every other thing on earth. Well, so, let me ask you a question. I, you know, I know how safe your products are. Were any of your products ever tested and, let's just say, failed? you know with the department of ag because it's happened to us and the we'll testing that they we'll the mode of testing to test our products was totally off base and we go back yes. to them and say hey, yeah you know and well, wrong. let's back up for the for everyone listening so what we're talking about is that we have to put lay on our label the department's ag make us guarantee certain colony forming units yep. of microbes on there which i think is interesting because it's really hard to take biology and say you're going to be exactly this per gram right mm -hmm. and they want you to say that you're going to be 10 million CFUs per gram, and you don't always have that, you know? So, um, yeah, and then one of the things when we first, uh, you know, we asked, there was many years ago, um, Oregon, Oregon tested one of our products. Well, let me, let me say too, like with the Department of Ag thing, we had to help them write their SOPs because they came to us and they're like, well, everyone failed for mycorrhiza that we tested, and you guys are a manufacturer of mycorrhiza. What, what do you think's happening? And I'm like, well, what's happening is, is you're trying to take a fertilizer that's been blended with mycorrhizae <laughs> and culture test it. Like, you can't do that. You can't, just, you can't mix a bunch of food products together and say, all right, go pick out the one grain of sugar in there. No, of course not. So, so we told them, it's like, this is what you have to do. You have to batch test the concentrate, certify the concentrate, and then you can do a document with the CDFA saying, all right, this much of the bacterial concentrate is being blended into this many grams of the phenol product, and then you can have a math equation that simply shows what it should be. And the CDFA said, okay, fine, we'll accept that. We don't like it, but we'll accept it. You got way further than we did. Uh, I, had, I, had to, I had to fight them tooth and nail. And I mean, the next stage is we help them start developing the next generation of testing, which is doing RNA testing, which has gotten really good. And you couldn't do it 10 years ago. Okay, so RNA testing is where you can sequence the DNA and RNA of the microbe reliably to say how many potential DNA snippets are in that gram, which then you can bring that back to how the cell count is. So you can reliably say this microbe's genetic code was in here 10 million times in that gram. And that is actually something you can do. That's the modern, well, the next 10 years will be testing products or micro products with that because it's actually good technology and it's exciting for that to happen you know when you, when years ago we had this you know we got a letter from it was the department of ag in oregon and they said that one of our products didn't have the count that we had on the label they also did. and we oregon sent just so everyone knows on this on this podcast mm -hmm. oregon sent letters to 92 percent of all the companies that have fertilizers or biologicals and said our lab tested it. It's like, wait, wait, what's more likely? All the industry failed, or maybe your lab, Oregon, you were using it. It's so funny that you said that because I feel it. Like, I, I remember when it happened, and I remember the uh, VP of our R&D, you know, reached out and said, well, how did you test it? You know, because we, we keep retained samples of every batch that goes out of all of our microbes. You know, and we, uh, we have a tremendous um, uh, culture bank and seed bank of our own microbes. And we said to them, 
you know, what, where'd you pull the product off the shelf? Was it old product? Was it new product? Yeah. Did you shake it? Was it expired? Yeah. If it was expired product, yeah. you're not going to pull it. And I remember yeah. they told us they took a pipe head and they tested it just from the surface. They did a surface test of it. And we said, did you shake the bottle up for any of this? And we told them the procedure of how to do it. And they said, well, we don't want to do it that way. You yeah, know we don't saying? want to do it that way. Yeah, this is how it. we do it. They said, this is how we do it. We said, but you're not going to, you need you're to. You're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Why, why is there all the other products in the market? They shake well before using. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we said, well, whoever you pull, whatever shelf you pulled this product off of, was it sitting in, was it stored properly? Was it not stored properly? You know, yeah. if you want to do it, we said, we're glad you send you a fresh batch right now overnight. We could test, nope, this is how we did it. And this is how it is. Oh, I, so yeah. As I, a manufacturer, yeah. I feel your strife so to speak when you say this because we we go through that also being in this type of business and being a biological company yeah once, once i guided oregon on what they needed to do the rna dna sequencing mm -hmm. they just quietly said um we just won't test stuff anymore because you know why because every test costs 150 dollars and they didn't want to test everything and it wasn't just 100 million dollars it was 150 plus 90 so they're, they're starting to spend a lot more money to to realize that they were wrong and that the test came back properly well that you know i mean so. it, 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 to see them i guess you know back off or, or you know let's say evolve a little bit with their testing is is it's important for everyone in our well, industry and commercial ag for products that are meaningful for any grower for whatever you're growing products that are environmentally safe that have you know microbes and the products that you know could keep the environment sustain the environment not hurt you know, and just really allow farmers to get the true you know amazing output from the genetics of whatever they're growing yeah i mean and you know what we've always liked about your company is that i think people use a lot of green grow products with a lot of microbe life products it's very tandem product yeah, vice versa we get you that know? all the time and you know we always we always throw in the redheaded stepchild of uh nectar for the gods because they're, they're always being used with our products too and uh scott ostrander the owner there i always like to um you know throw him out there for he, he was always promoting your company and our company a lot always in tandem with his products um he's the little wild man uh we know that um he's wilder than most so we're going to try to have him on the podcast next if he can uh, try to not curse and scream um, yeah, scott's a great guy um i speak to him you know once in a once in a while throughout the year and he's always been a very big proponent of green grow and microb life I remember the first time that we had like a real deep conversation many years ago and he was amazing. He said, I want to put your, you know, your products in my sample kits for Nectar. And I said, that's amazing. I said, but just from a business point, point, as much as I appreciate it and the exposure, you know, you know, why? And he said, because you have the best photosynthetic bacteria in the market. I'm not going to look to come up with it and change people's minds. So I want them to have access because it makes our products work amazing. You know, yeah. so, yeah. you know, I, I appreciate a lot, everything a lot, he's done for us. Yeah, there's a lot of synergy there, you know, and I mean, I think, you know, getting back to the core of everything, I think, you know, having the customers or any of the listeners of this podcast understand the origin story of where you guys came from. My whole thing is like, I just want people to be introduced to biology in every single element, every single front, right? And so, you know, Green Grow does mycorrhizal fungi production. We do phosphorus digesters. We do you know, various other microbes, but you guys do microbes that are so unique and different from us that I've always really liked the combination. I like how they affect the change. You know, I'm a big guy about terpenes and terpene development in cannabis, and I'm like, terpenes can only be turned on and turned off by the presence of microbes. So you'll get a little bit of terpenes without microbes, but when you have a diversity of microbes from totally different you know regions you're gonna have such a better terpene profile so i want to at least let the, the listeners know that you know we use the photosynthetic microbe that microbe life makes in our garden and in our test farm um and you know i think vice versa and uh you know if there's anything else you wanted to add to the, the customers or the people that are listening to this podcast that maybe they don't know well i want to say one thing before we even do that i'm going to tell you something i don't know if you remember because i remember clearly the first time we met it was either 2017 or 2018 it was my first 
experience taking a booth at the Emerald Cup in Santa Rosa. We were both in the Hall of Flowers. And I remember I met you, and I remember we had like a great half hour conversation. And if you don't remember it, that's okay. I wouldn't be offended. And that's it. I, I remember certain things, and I remember meeting you in the booth in the Wall of Flower, Hall of Flowers, and we were talking about microbes and you know your mode of action, our mode of action, the synergies that we have as companies. And since then, Green Grow has always been. You know, a company I've always looked at, your company and what you do in the market, the credibility that you have. You know, you start to see companies come in, they try and jump on whatever bandwagon, yeah. they don't understand yeah. how difficult it is, they think they're yeah. going to make a ton of money overnight, yeah. and you know what? They disappear. Yeah. So I want to congratulate you, your product, your science, your education, your commitment to the cultivators, because you are a true product and authority in this industry and that means something and i'm honored to sit here with you because no, you see you. companies come and go and then you see companies that don't want to embrace the other companies yeah you know it's great for us to work together as manufacturers because yeah. i have product you don't have you have product i don't have but because our products are so meaningful and synergistic it just helps the community that you and i love so much so i appreciate being here being in the same company with you because i yeah. still i really no no bs i remember the first time we ever met and shaking your hand you're trying to say, and I have no idea. I don't remember. No, okay. no, no, no. And I left. That's okay. I do. I do remember. <laughs> I, was, I mean, we used to do the Emerald Cup all the time, and you know, I haven't done the Emerald Cup in a couple of years now. Same here. And that was a that was a prestige show. It changed. Was happening. It actually it changed me personally. Yeah. Growing up in New York and the East Coast, and always being a fan of cannabis and the community. When I first came out to the Emerald Cup and saw 30,000 like-minded people mm -hmm. in one fairgrounds yeah. of different races, religion, ages, creeds, backgrounds in one symbiotic community, it was beautiful. And I remember talking to my friends at home when I got back to New York saying, you know, like, this is amazing. You know, and to come to New York where the culture wasn't really near oh, where it is. And it's getting there now. It's getting there it's now. It's getting there the now. Changing, a lot of yeah. consumption lounges, people are coming together. But that could be one defining moment in my career. Coming out to that first Emerald Cup and having that experience. I, I, I remember calling my wife at that point. I said, I said, this is just something I've never seen before. So I'm glad we met then and I'm glad we're sitting down now and whatever we could do together for the future to continue to make, you know, the the cultivators understand why they do need our product. No matter what the situation in the market is, if you want to put the best quality flower out, you could still grow craft quality cannabis at scale. You don't have to give up flavor, aroma, terpene production just because you're growing in a 40,000 square foot house, greenhouse, or you're growing outdoors. You don't have to sacrifice crap quality. And I think with your product and my product, we form together and, uh, you we know. get massive terpene development and that's really what all, I've been a terp farmer for a long time. I don't, I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, well, it's got to be 29, 30% THC. I'm like, look. I don't care if it's 25% no. THC or 22% THC. If I have four and a half, five percent terpenes, I will beat anyone up and down the block. Yeah, you know, on the canopy. You and I are very aligned. You know, you see the reports come out, and people strive to hit certain percentages of the THC, and you know, it's really the terpene profiles that you really want to see shine through those reports. You know, it's something similar. It's like, you know, even if you just take that analogy of, you know, people look for THC in our market with what you're producing, what I'm producing. You'll have competitors come in and say they have a microbe and say, oh, this bag of my dry amendments have X amount of billions of microbes, or this liquid has X amount of billions. Yeah, it's a nice number to put on marketing on your label, mm -hmm. but are all the microbes in there actually doing anything to the plant? They could be one strain that's actually working, and the rest is just fluff. Yeah, it could be fluff, it or could, it could be DOA. Of I course. mean, you know, a lot of the shit's DOA, I've noticed. I mean, I've done some testing in my day because obviously we have some competitors that have products that can kind of be similar and then you're like oh this looks like a good product but it's really expensive and you go test it and you're like oh uh 90 percent of it's not alive okay. yeah it's not alive well shit so you know it's nice to see you and me and our products with the science that you have the r d that our companies both put together and the work that's being put in to be able to have a product where everything that bottle is being put to use you know and you could look past you know competitors or you know copycat that try and come in and say oh wow this one 16 ounce bottle or this one 16 ounce bag has all this back to oh that happens all the time you to know? us i mean it, i've 
in the I don't know, 15 or 16 years I've been doing this, I mean, I have people come in and they're like, oh, yeah, we're way more concentrated than you. I'm like, well, that's weird. Why is your top perform as well as mine? Exactly. You know, so, I mean, we, we, we've seen very similar things throughout, you know, the industry. And I can tell you, you know, obviously, I'll be, you know, last year, you know, was, you know, very different for the cannabis market. Oh, yeah. I mean, cultivation, we... the fluctuation of price per pound. Yeah. And you still see, you see a lot of companies go away. But even through the difficult times and maybe cultivators, you know, cutting back on money, you know, you still see, you know, money on spending for amendments. When you can show up still year after year and see a company like Gringo uh, Biologicals and Microblife still be here, it's, it's a testament. It's a testament to the efficacy of the products and to, uh, you know, the, the trust that we've built with the Cultivation Network. So with that, I could say, you know, cheers to you and your team and, uh, you know, and, and anything and ending, you, you know, I think yeah. all manufacturers that are meaningful you know we need to work closer together we need mm -hmm. to work you know with the ever-changing climate of the business and you know the stronger companies with the best products like yours and yeah. mine and i'm, not, and I'm just, you know we we'll, we will continue gonna, to press forward yeah we're going to prevail and i mean again when the cannabis switches back to people care about quality and flavor which is starting to happen already again yep you have these ebbs and flows every couple of years we're like oh we want to go cheap 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 and then all the consumers start saying after a year or so yeah you used to have good stuff i don't want to buy from you more that's the trigger that's in their head oh we're going to go back to microbes we're going to go back to organic so i see that coming back around and so i mean i'm just glad that well tell me this you know before we conclude yeah one of the common areas uh, that i've been getting a lot of questions on whether it's right to our email you know on our website or the direct messages on social media i'm getting a lot of growers that were using you know very popular salt-based nutrients say, you can say the name i'd rather not you can say the word <laughs> i'd rather not there are, <laughs> there are other companies too you know yeah and one of the common questions well inquiries i'm getting there are from growers that are using that system they believed in the system and then they saw maybe after a year year and a half the flavor, aroma, terpene profiles, no matter what genetics they were using, were now all coming out very similar. There was nothing, wow, look what we just did. And those growers are now coming to us and asking us, hey, all right, we stopped using the biologicals, we told we needed sterile systems. Could we use your photosynthesis in yeah. our regimen? Could we use your new Terps Plus in our we regimen? We call that Synganic, right? So that's the new, the new term, Synganic. It's sweeping across the nation right now. Now they're like, okay, wait, the salts didn't work. So now we're gonna do salts plus microbes, yeah. which is, you know, microbes are gonna produce more terpenes, but I'm like, it's just gonna be another phase until they start going, okay, well now we need a little bit more organics. Mm -hmm. So it's a pendulum swing. Yeah, that's know? a great way to put it. It's a pendulum swing, but that's probably been the most common reach out to us. Hey, I use this system, but I'm not getting what I used to get. Can I re-implement yours? And we say, yes. Yes, you can. And I'm sure it's the exact same yes for Green Grow Biologicals for those, you know, growers, cultivators that, you know, backed away for a little bit. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I think we're going to see the next 36 months. That's going to be the time window I'm putting on it to normalization of, you know, organic microbe dominant cannabis again. Um, I think over the next 12 months, we're going to make some more gains from where we, you know, went to. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, again, and I think everything's on a seven year cycle. It's just kind of my philosophy in life. So, you know, you, you do three years of massive growth, right? And mm -hmm. the industry took a dive. Yes, it did. So three years of a dive and then three, you know, three years going up and you know what I mean? So that's what I see happening. So, um, but anyways, I mean, this has been such a pleasure. I, you know, can't thank you enough so much for being yeah. on the show. Thank you. It's great to be um, next to you after all the craziness yeah. in this world the last few years. To Absolutely. be out here in Willits, California, yeah. you know, in your territory, to be back with the people. Yep. You know, this is where, you know, we thrive, right? You and I. So, so thank you for having me. No, thank you. And so so for everyone listening, so where where do they find you? What are the ways to get a hold of you, reach you? All right. Well, the good old way, you could go to our website, microbelifehydro.com. And you could see thousands of testimonials, growers of all sizes, of um, small, medium, large scale growers, no matter if they're growing in a two by two grow tent or they're growing in a 40,000, you know, square foot indoor greenhouse of vertical farming. You could see those testimonials on our Instagram page, which we're, the, we're very active on, which is at microbe life hydro. 
And uh, so that, that would be really the, the two main spots. And you could see the content we have is from our lab, showing you where the microbes are born, how they're born, born in the individual bottle, what our microbes look like underneath the microscope, just to show you that, uh, you know, these products are the real deal. We're not, you know, making it, you know, we're not slapping a label on it, buying it from another company. We are the prime manufacturers and producers of these microbes. And everything, you know, starts from our lab, the R&D facility, um, and then it goes through all the quality control. You know, we don't, you know, everything is batched. Uh, everything's retained with batch samples. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's been a lot of fun being in this market, being in this industry. And I always say, whenever I have the opportunity to be on a podcast or any type of interview setting, this is the best community. I've been in other markets for our company, which are great people, but the cannabis community is something that's special and it's i i think that i could look back in my 15 years now of being in this community i'm honored and grateful to be a part of it well thank you again brett for coming on the show for everyone who's listening green grow regenerate podcast we can be found at the green grow on instagram thegreengrow.com with no w and youtube's going to be green grow biologicals perfect so anyone we're going to have more episodes just like this coming out in the future, so stay tuned. And I can tell you this. If you're ever in Florida, we roll out the red carpet. You come see us, and you'll see our whole facility. That's what we would love to do. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much to everyone and all the Green Grow um, listeners. Thank you for listening to the very first Regenerate podcast episode. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Also, leave us a five-star review. Thank you.